Hey guys, it's Keith Foskey. Last night, I had the opportunity to debate Reverend Daniel Hyde on the subject of infant baptism. We were hosted by Mason Craig on his channel called Simply Theology. My conversation with Danny is one of the most enjoyable debates that I've had so far. It wasn't an overly formal debate, and it wasn't supposed to be. We both had an opening statement, and then we fielded questions. So I wanted to share it with you all and hopefully get your feedback in the comments. So here we go. Welcome to Simply Theology, a podcast and YouTube channel that makes theology clear, concise, and accessible for the everyday Christian. Today, we're going to be discussing baptism, more specifically, what baptism is, and who is the proper subjects of baptism. I'm joined by two guests today, both here with different differing views on baptism. And throughout the evening, if you have any questions, please comment them uh, on the YouTube live stream. Uh, because I will be taking questions, and uh, I may not be able to get them all, but I'm hoping to get a good amount. So uh, just a heads up again uh, regarding tonight's debate. I already told some people earlier, uh, this is going to be a little bit more informal than uh, may maybe some of the debates you've seen online. So we're not going to be having a rigid structure. We're going to be having uh, kind of some bookends of structure. So um, after I kind of introduce the guests, uh, they're going to each get six to eight minutes uh, of opening statements, and then they're going to be getting, uh, at the end, six to eight minutes of closing statements. Uh, but in the, in between there, uh, I'm really hoping that we can get some kind of back and forth conversation, uh, discussion between the guests. Uh, and, and I want to be able to have some question at, questions asked by myself, by the audience, and by, uh, by the guests as well. Um, all right. Now that I've uh, kind of given you the rundown of where we're headed, I'd like to introduce the, the two guests that we have tonight. All right. So coming to us from Jacksonville, Florida, a well-known pastor, humorist, podcaster. You may know him as the king of all millennialism, but to, tonight he is the defender of credo baptism. Please welcome Pastor Keith Foskey. Keith, hey. it's great to see you. Hey, brother, thank you for having me on the show, and uh, I appreciate you considering me for this. Uh, I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, it's great to have you. Um, yeah, so as, as you probably knew by the um, the posters, Keith is the, uh, the first guest I have today, and uh, the second one coming to us from Oceanside, California. This is a pastor, author, podcaster as well, and tonight's defender of infant baptism. Uh, I'm pleased to announce... Uh, to, pleased to introduce to you Dr. Daniel Hyde, Pastor Daniel Hyde. Good evening, guys. Thank Thanks for being here. Good to be here. Good to be here. Keith, bring your inner Methodist, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> a absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to bring the fire. Wow, that was... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so thanks for being here, guys. We got a lot of people... I'm excited to hear this, excited to watch. And uh, yeah, I just want to just thank you for volunteering for your time. And I know you're both pastors. So, you know, I know there's obviously a lot of, you know, shepherding, uh, preaching of the word, all, all these responsibilities and just taking time out to discuss this. Uh, it's a pleasure. I know a lot of people are going to benefit from it wh wherever they uh, stand on baptism. And uh, as I told you both, you know, the goal is to, you know, create uh, a discussion where there is more unity or you know friendliness than than some of those out there where there might be a little bit more hostility and you know obviously it's fine to you know get into the into the discussion tonight but you know I, I my my prayer and hope is that you know there, we we walk away from it you know uh, you know remaining um, you know united around Christ and and so thanks for uh, for being here absolutely um, yeah. Yeah, so as I as I said, we're going to be getting into some six to eight minute opening statements. But before we do that, um, I'd love to just hear from both of you uh, one at a time, kind of your background, uh, your church background, kind of when it comes to baptism in particular, how you came to the view you have. Maybe you held it your whole life and, and it, you, you know, you were just convicted of it. Maybe you didn't come to it. Um, as a new Christian, I just would love to hear and the audience I'm sure would, would benefit from hearing kind of your 
theological journey, if you will, uh, to the current position that you hold. Um, and Keith, would you mind going first? Sure. Be happy to. Uh, well, I was actually brought up in a uh, uh, Disciples of Christ Church, which if anybody knows what that is, that is the the far left side of the restoration movement, which is the the far right of that would be like the Church of Christ. So this this entire movement has a lot of issues. And um, they teach something called uh, baptismal remission for sins, and they baptize in the name of Jesus only and things like that. So there's some really odd things that I grew up with in regard to baptism. But when I was saved, I was actually saved through a uh, the, the evangelism of a friend. I wasn't saved in, in church. I was saved through the evangelism of a friend and uh, became pretty convinced early on that uh, believer's baptism was the direction that I believe the Bible taught and ended up going to a Southern Baptist seminary, not the Southern Baptist seminary, but I went to Jacksonville Baptist Theological Seminary, which is a Southern Baptist seminary in my hometown did all of my work there, all of my master's and doctorate degree, did all of that there, and uh, became even more convinced of the uh, Credo Baptist position. Now, the thing that has changed since then is I wasn't a Calvinist. In fact, that the, the, the seminary I went to said Calvinism is bad, bad, bad. And if you're a Calvinist, it's going to destroy your church. So thankfully, God led me out of that. And so I am now a Calvinistic Baptist. Some people call Reformed Baptist. But when I say that, it gives R. Scott Clark the, um, <laughs> I try not to say it too much, <laughs> Calvinist who's also a Baptist. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, I'm, I'm. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, yeah, it's it, you know, encouraging to hear your journey to Calvinism. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, yeah, um, Daniel, would you uh, would you mind sharing kind of a little bit about yours? I uh, we'd love to hear from you as sure. well. Yeah, I think uh, some people know a bit of my story. It's in my book, uh, Welcome to Reformed Church. So it's kind of out there, but. Um, so I was baptized uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, Long Beach, California, and uh, kind of off and on uh, churchgoer as a little kid. My dad was converted uh, in the Calvary Chapel movement. <clears throat> yeah, in Calvary, we call it Big Calvary, uh, the original Calvary Chapel of Chuck Smith. So my dad was converted there back in the days, the tent. Um, so during the Jesus movement in the 70s. And so uh, my earliest mem memories of church are Calvary Chapel um and going to friday night movie night and watching awesome movies like crossing the switchblade thief in the, thief in the night all this fun stuff <laughs> thief in the night yes. yeah you know and then driving home in the back of our uh of our uh, griswold family truckster just in fear that the rapture was gonna happen so um uh you know my, my parents separated divorced kind of a tumultuous childhood and so uh we'd go to you know midnight mass with my grandparents uh, around Christmas time every year. Uh, but then my dad, you know, came back to the Lord uh, after a long series, long season of backsliding and, uh, brought me with, with him or invited me to go. I was a teenager at the time. So I went and sat in the very back row of, uh, Hope Chapel, Hermosa Beach, California, four square church, go sister Amy. And, uh, that was when I was saved. So came to the Lord, um, you know, consciously and, you know, gave my life to him. Uh, I knew nothing about, you know, denominations and theology. I just was happy to know that my sins were forgiven. And so uh, I was a basketball player, played basketball in college, uh, went to a, went to an Assemblies of God college <clears throat> on a basketball scholarship. And it was there that uh, really disillusioned by, by all the stuff that I was seeing, um, just wasn't satisfied intellectually and spiritually, emotionally with the kind of Christianity that that I knew, which was, you know, Calvary Chapel, Foursquare, AG, you know, various kinds of non-denom, Vineyard, all the all the fun SoCal uh, alphabet soup. And so I started asking questions uh, in a class from uh, a theology professor, a required theology class. And so he would, he literally just took me to his office after class every day and would say, you know, you have some great questions. They've already been answered. Uh, here, take this book off my shelf by Martin Luther, his commentary on Galatians. Uh, I'd come back and say, I read that. What do I do next? Okay. Uh, you ever heard of this guy named Louis Burkhoff? No, never heard of him. You know, read this, you know, boom, read, read that, read that Calvin, uh, Spurgeon, Edwards, Owen, like all the, all the, all the names that people would recognize. And so that's how I became uh, more and more 
reformational, I would say. I was a youth pastor in the, in the, in the, in the, in the AG at the time. So you know, I wasn't allowed to be a Calvinist, but uh, I was becoming more and more understanding of that and uh, graduated, figured out what I was going to do with my life. Um, my choices were to go to Fuller Seminary, which was where all the religion students went to, the Bible students. But this professor said, you don't want to go to, you don't want to go to Fuller, you want to go to Westminster. And so I uh, never heard of Westminster, um, never heard of Escondido, California, drove all the way down, uh, found an apartment to live in, had a roommate, this Dutch guy, never met a Dutch guy my entire life. Um, Sunday comes and goes, I went to like, kind of like the, charis uh, I don't want to call it the charismatic, but went to kind of like the evangelical-ish PCA uh, in town, and uh, Sunday night rolls around, and my roommate's like, hey, I'm getting ready for church, you coming? I'm like, who goes to church Sunday nights? <laughs> <laughs> Watch the football game, you know? He's like, oh, we're Dutch Reformed. We go to church twice on the Sunday. I was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. All right, I'll go with you. So I went uh, to the Escondido Christian Reformed Church, now the United Reformed Church. And uh, the pastor was preaching through Romans chapter nine. Uh, just blew my socks off. Uh, the singing, uh, just right from the hymnal, Psalms, hymns, uh, the reverence, the the typical Dutch, you know, if anyone out there has gone to a like an old school Dutch Reformed church, like just the typical sobriety of it all. It was so different for me. Um, and yeah, so that, that's like, that was my introduction to like real reformed church, um, reformation church. And, you know, so infant baptism was never an issue for me. Um, I, I knew that that's what the Catholic church did. That's what I was, that's what I had, had done to me. Uh, I read through the Heidelberg catechism. I read through, you know, all the confessional documents that were in the back of the hymnal. I read them was good to go with those. Um, I wouldn't say I understood all the ins and outs, but that was my, that was my like introduction to it all. And that's how I came, came around. And, you know, in my mind, I've only come to be more strong, in my opinion on that. So. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing guys that, you know, it just gives the audience, it gives myself kind of this, you know, background information uh, on who you are, how you came to this view. And it, you know, it, it takes you off the screen as uh being just you know a, per, a, a flat yep. screen, we were able to kind of <laughs> humanize you a bit. So that's that's great. Um, right before we dehumanize each other, yeah. today, <laughs> just going to absolutely destroy each other. Well, Keith, oh, Keith yeah. has to add a Dutch a Dutch reform guy to his to his ensemble. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> yeah, I first. Yeah, I, I just first off, um, I just have to play this. You know. Mm. Let's get ready to <laughs> I I took a lot of work to get that. Um, there you go. <laughs> so, um, just really quick before you guys go into your opening statements, um, I just wanted to plug this for people. I'm going to be giving this away tonight. Uh, R.C. Sproul biography by Stephen Nichols, and uh, what we're going to be doing after the debate in the the post-debate discussion, we're going to have some R.C. Sproul trivia. So five to six questions. If you get whoever gets the most um, answers correct, we'll be getting this book. So nice. I just want to that... say, I think I, I, I think you're poisoning the well by giving away a Presbyterian book. I just want you to know, I, 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 I feel already offended. Well, I picked <laughs> R.C. Sproul because I thought that that might be a little bit more, you know. He just... is my hero. And if I could preach yeah. like anyone, I'd want to preach like him. So. I did just get a uh, book in the mail from RH, you, RHB by uh, C. H. Spur uh, of C. H. Spurgeon. So there you go. That, that oh, that's yeah. my picture. They put they use my picture yeah, on the cover. I know. Yeah. Wow, you came back to life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you wore the red, the, a similar red tie, Keith, to the to the all the advertisements. It just makes it look. <laughs> I'm a lot wearing more... what I have in the app. This is the exact tie. Yeah. I, I pulled it out because, you know, I I, I, uh, I, I well. I'm wearing shorts if that helps. If that makes you feel better, so Danny. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing shorts. I'm going beach cash, though. I'm going beach <laughs> cash. I am wearing shorts. <laughs> um, but that's that's the the Zoom culture now. <laughs> that's All right. right. All right. Well, um <clears throat> I'd love to just kind of get into it and um let you guys talk, let you guys share your, your views. And um do either of you have a preference on uh who would who would like to go first? Yeah, I can go first. That's fine. All right. All right. I'm good. Yeah. With that. So, all right. Uh, let me really quickly here. I'll put my timer on. <laughs> yeah. Let me do that too. And oh, I, t I told Keith, uh, 
that this is, you know, the six to eight minutes, think of it as parlay, you know, in Pirates of the Caribbean. It's a guideline. So, you know, I'm not going to be like 801, like, eh. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, it's a guideline. You don't have to, I mean, obviously try to stay within the parameters, but if, if you have a thought, you know, just it, it's fine. So, yep. um, yeah. And let me give you the screen. It's not me. All right. So infant baptism uh, or covenant baptism, you know, baptize your babies. You've probably seen that hashtag online. If I was to explain that to you know, to anybody, it would just be real simple. Uh, the Bible is a story. It's written over 1,500 plus years uh, on three continents by dozens of authors in three different languages. Uh, and it tells one story that God saves sinners. Uh, the story moves from Genesis in our creation and God's covenant in the garden uh, to our unbelief and then into Exodus and our redemption. And that redemption foreshadows uh, a greater redemption to come by a greater savior, greater than Moses, not just another Moses, but greater than, better than Moses, uh, who foreshadowed uh, in those sacrifices of the law, the once and for all sacrificial lamb uh, and sort of ironically, the same one who is the lamb is also the priest. So the final high priest, the final lamb, uh, to liberate us from a greater Pharaoh uh, and a greater Egypt, uh, a worse Pharaoh, a worse Egypt, Satan, uh, and our own sins. And finally, the story, uh, as it goes to the Gospels and it chronicles the fulfillment of those types and shadows uh, in this one great book, this one big story, uh, it all comes to a consummation, of course, in Revelation, especially 21 and 22. Uh, with the new heavens, new earth, uh, the new creation, uh, the new temple, uh, new Jerusalem. So uh, this this one story uh, comes in multiple acts, yet uh, it's one story. Uh, so much so that uh, St. Augustine said very famously that uh, the, the uh, New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. So that's the, that's how you know, we understand uh, the the history and the flow of the Bible. It's one big story. It's one big book with many different chapters, uh, multiple acts. So the issue really of infant baptism, uh, from my vantage point at least, um, is a matter of hermeneutic, her, uh, hermeneutics, you know, how we read the Bible. Um, you know, in, or I would say to somebody, you know, it's really a matter of our expectations. Like, what are we, what are we looking for um, when we read the Bible? What are we looking to get out uh, of the Bible, what are we trying to uh, to see there when we talk about issues like baptism? Um, you know, and if I was being kind of rhetorical about it, I would say, well, do you want to read the Bible like Jesus? <laughs> do you want to just uh, re read it like he taught his disciples uh, in Luke's Gospel, chapter twenty-four, on the Emmaus Road, when uh, he says it's all one big story that all points to him, uh, or how James read the Bible at the Jerusalem Council in Acts fifteen, uh, explaining Amos nine and the, the fallen booth of david that had been restored as the resurrection of jesus and the inclusion of the gentiles under god's covenant do we, read, do we want to read the old testament in the bible like paul uh, rabbi saul is like the column uh, 1 corinthians 10 uh, where all the old testament types and shadows are all uh, being uh, they're all pointing us to jesus and so um you know and we like to laugh about that text 1 corinthians 10 because uh that's where infants were baptized uh, in the Old Testament, the whole entire uh, nation of Israel, the, the sons of Israel, uh, went through the Red Sea on dry land. Um, First Peter chapter 1, uh, where the, the apostle says that the ancient prophets searched their own scrolls to try to figure out uh, who was speaking in them, uh, of whom were their scrolls speaking, when uh, and where these things were going to be fulfilled. And these are all the things that, as Peter says, uh, they've come to reality uh, as you've heard the gospel preach to you. So Christological, redemptive historical, covenantal, you know, how, whatever phrase we like to use. Um, this is how we understand the Bible, how we read it as one big story. Uh, and so when we open our Bibles, uh, there's Adam uh, and uh, whatever he was going to do or whatever he didn't do, uh, he would affect everybody else to come. And so there's a representational idea that's already happening uh, from the first human beings 
uh, that Adam's uh, obedience or disobedience is going to affect all those that uh, that that followed him. Uh, we see it in Cain, this this principle of representation where his sin affects his whole line. So Genesis four, his line is known for all kinds of human exploits, metallurgy, de domestication of animals, um, music, city building. But yet there's this line of Abel that's been martyred that's yet has a uh, replacement in the person of Seth. Uh, and in those days, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And so Seth stands for that people, right? That congregation, that, that corporate body that called upon God's name. And so we then come to Noah, uh, the one righteous man. Because of, of one righteous man, uh, his wife and his three sons and then th their three wives get to enter the ark. And they get to come in and uh, they they pass through the water, as Peter says, they they pass through the waters of baptism uh, and they are saved. Uh, we know how the story turns out. Uh, his kids are kind of scoundrels, but yet the point still remains that uh, God was working and saving uh, and operating in a way that was bigger than just the one righteous man. He always includes those around him, his household, as we see that in Abraham, for example. Uh, the one man, right? Uh, he is chosen out of a out of a family of idolaters. Joshua nine tells us uh, he's chosen. Genesis twelve. Uh, he believes, and the Lord counts it to him as righteousness. Uh, and it's interesting, of course, as Paul, Rabbi Saul, interprets uh, Genesis twelve through seventeen uh, later on in Romans three and four. Uh, his point is that Abraham believed first, and then was circumcised, uh, and then he circumcised his children even before they uh, believed. And so. Um, uh, Ishmael was a little bit older, he circumcised, and then you have Isaac, uh, and then you have, of course, all of his household, all of his servants, anyone associated with him uh, were to be circumcised, and then going forth, all male children uh, on the eighth day. So that idea of a covenant, right, that God is working through a large body, uh, a big group uh, to work out his salvation, and you have it with Isaac and his two sons, Jacob and Esau. Uh, they're both circumcised, yet, of course, we know that God loves Jacob and he hates Esau. So uh, that same thing there um, with Moses and uh, the people of Israel. Moses is a representative person. Uh, and we see it in, in Exodus 4 when his own son isn't circumcised and his wife's like, hey, you better do something about this or God's going to judge you. And so she cuts off the foreskin, throws at his feet, uh, Zipporah, his wife, uh, and uh, she obeys the Lord. And so uh, there's judgment averted. In the wilderness, um, they, they wander. And of course, a whole generation dies. Uh, that new generation enters into the promised land in Joshua's day, but they hadn't been circumcised because their parents were disobedient, their grandparents were disobedient. And so there's a big circumcision party. And uh, they, through that line and through those generations and those tribes and those peoples, those clans, those households, uh, God, in a very big way, worked to save a remnant of grace. The days of Elijah, there were only 7,000 who hadn't bowed their knees to Baal. Uh, in the time of the prophet Isaiah, he says that the whole head to the foot of the people of God, uh, as they're personified as one person, um, they're, they're sick from the head to the foot. But yet God was reserving a remnant of grace. In all that big story of God working in this big way to this big, huge family, this big, huge nation, they're all, all the males are circumcised. That's the sign of God's covenant with them. Uh, all that comes to its head and all that comes to its reality in Matthew 1, verse 1. Uh, and then... Uh, Again, the expectation. What's our, what's our expectation when we get to that white space between Malachi uh, or Second Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible uh, and Matthew? What's what's our expectation? Uh, the expectation is that God should continue to work this way uh, unless uh, He does something about it. Um, sometimes we talk about the regular principle of worship in Reformed uh, Presbyterian uh, Calvinistic churches. You know, what, we only do what God requires us to do, what God commands, and so. I would say that this is a simple, similar example uh, that God commanded a sign to be placed upon males in the Old Testament on the eighth day, circumcision. And that principle is going to apply going forward unless God himself explicitly uh, revokes it. And so uh, we read in the Gospels, we read in the, in the story of uh, the New Testament uh, that John the baptizer, uh, that he had a baptism for repentance. We would expect this because the people were disobedient. Go back to Isaiah, from the head of the foot, they're, they've been disobedient. And so we would expect that when God was going to revive his people, he would start with the males uh, and the men, and that there would be 
there would be repentance and baptism. So uh, we don't see that as, you know, a, a paradigm of, you know, believer's baptism. We see it as this is a covenantal thing uh, that is happening uh, for the people of God to be revived uh, and refreshed. And so uh, we come to the Gospels then. And so we have those males who have repented and who have believed and who've given themselves to the Messiah. Uh, and then their own, their very own children, Jesus picks up and he blesses them and he welcomes into his uh, into his arms and into the very circle of the disciples and even the disciples who are angry about it and are like, what are you doing, Jesus? Jesus says, no, to such belongs my kingdom. So uh, we have that principle, I would say, of God's inclusion uh, of a much larger group, uh, the households, the families. And so when Matthew 28 comes and we read Jesus telling us uh, his disciples to make uh, his disciples, his apostles to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing and teaching, you know, what should we expect? Uh, we should expect this very thing uh, where they're going to go out they're going to proclaim the kingdom of God has come uh, to Jews and Gentiles. Uh, male adults especially are going to repent and believe, uh, and something is going to happen. Uh, and we see that in Acts, 3,000 males. Uh, the Jews had a requirement three times a year for all males uh, to attend uh, Jerusalem for the three required feasts. And this was one of them, the feast of the Passover, the, first, uh, the, the feast of the, of the first fruits. And uh, all those required males were there. 3,000 of them apparently believed they were baptized. Uh, they repented. They believed they were baptized. That's what we would expect uh, for people who are giving themselves to the Messiah, uh, who've learned from their infancy, as Paul tells Timothy later on, uh, from his very grandmother's knee. Uh, he's learned the word of God. So he, they've come to repent. They've come to believe. But then we find something strange, don't we? That in the book of Acts, uh, the households and I would say we don't need to have in instances of explicit uh, babies crawling around on dirt floors in first century uh, Sumerian or Judean houses. Uh, but it's the same pattern that God gave to Father Abraham, uh, to you, to your sons, and to all those who are far off. To your, you, your sons, your servants, your strangers, your household, uh, the Gentiles. Uh, it's all those who are included are going to come and be baptized. And we see, for example, the Philippian jailer, just one example of that, uh, where he, of course, asked, what must I do to be saved? They say, believe in the Lord Jesus, you should, you should be saved, you, you and your whole household. Uh, and that happens. And they go and they preach uh, into the household. And everybody in the house, of course, hears. Uh, this is what we do in a church, uh, uh, you know, when a gathered assembly happens. But it's interesting, in, in Acts 16, I believe it's in verse 34, we read that um, uh, he rejoiced, the Philippian jailer, he rejoiced along with his household. So they all rejoiced. Why? Because he, singular, because he believed. The whole household rejoiced. The whole household was baptized. Why? Because the one man was saved. And this takes us all the way back to the beginning, like I said, uh, the story of Adam, the story of Seth, uh, Abel, Seth, Noah, uh, all, uh, uh, all the patriarchs, the prophets. This is what we would expect as new covenant believers reading our bible as one big story and so uh just to kind of bring it to a conclusion uh the household codes for example ephesians chapter six the oikos right the household code uh these make sense we can read the new testament making sense of it um just like in exodus 12 when all the children were gathered around for the passover meal and they asked you know what's the meaning of the service children are there they're expected to be there because they're in the covenant of god's uh, grace and promises and just like in Deuteronomy, they're there. And the same thing, Paul writes a letter to a gathered congregation in Ephesus, and he expects children to be gathered there uh, in public worship to hear this letter read. And he actually addresses them. Uh, he speaks to them. He applies the fifth commandment to them. Uh, he, of course, says that uh, the promise of the fifth commandment is that they would live long lives in the earth because uh, he's now recognizing that the gospel has gone forth from the land, the promised land, to the whole world, to the Gentile world. Uh, but those children are there, and they are in the Lord. They are to obey their parents in the Lord. Uh, again, that's covenant language. That comes right from the Old Testament. Um, and so uh, the Bible is one big story. The Bible uh, is a story of how God works and operates to save sinners. He does that through covenants, uh, professing believers and their children, and even households and servants in the Old Testament. God works in this big way. Uh, to work out his promise of grace. And he gives signs uh, in that promise of grace. And those signs were circumcision and now uh, our baptism. So one big story, 
God saves sinners. And the way that he does that is through his covenant of grace. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Keith, don't worry about the time. <laughs> I forgot to turn nope. my timer on. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Uh, you know, it's. Well, I we timed myself time. beforehand, and I think I'll make it under eight minutes. So I'll, Hopefully that was more um, than a, Christ, a sermonette for Christianettes. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. So why don't you go ahead, Keith, and, uh, and yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Mason, for having me on. I want to thank you, Danny, for participating in this debate with me. And I want to say to the audience, I am what is called a credo Baptist. Credo means I believe, and therefore we baptize someone only after they confess to believe the gospel. And we would not knowingly baptize someone who is unable or who refuses to confess the gospel. The 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith gives a good definition of what I believe about baptism and what it does. It says in chapter 29, baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ to be unto the party baptized a sign of his fellowship with him in his death and resurrection of his being engrafted into him of remission of sins, and of giving up into God through Jesus Christ the life uh, to live and walk in the newness of life. Those who do actually profess repentance toward God, faith in, and obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ are the only proper subjects of this ordinance. So that's what it means to be a credo Baptist. And as an affirmed credo Baptist, I reject the practice of baptizing an infant based upon the faith of their parents. Now, it's important that I admit that my position is the minority report in church history. Paedo-baptism does have a long history within Christianity. It is practiced by the majority of mainline Protestant denominations, as well as the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic communions. But here's where we mustn't allow history to confuse us. While the practice of infant baptism is wide within Christianity, the reason for its practice is varied. The Presbyterian, the Lutheran, and the Roman Catholic all baptize their babies, but they all do so for different reasons. The Catholic and Eastern Orthodox believe in something called baptismal regeneration, and so do Lutherans as well, but many Presbyterians don't. According to Kevin Gardner, who writes for Ligonier Ministries, quote, the reform view asserts that baptism does not regenerate, end quote. So while there's a consistency regarding the subjects of baptism between these groups, there's not a consistency as to the reason why they baptize infants. Therefore, any appeal to historic tradition without recognizing the differences would be misleading. Yes, baptizing infants is the majority report, but the reason has not been consistent. So what is interesting about this is that there's actually a consistency between Baptists and Presbyterians on this issue. We both reject baptismal regeneration, and we both believe that baptism is done preliminary to entrance into the visible church. The question then becomes, who is rightly a part of the new covenant church? Who is a part of the new covenant? In fact, that's really the question. The visible church is made up of those who are members of the new covenant, so who is in the new covenant? Is it believers only? Or is it believers and they're not yet believing children? This question leads us to examine the covenants. It is true that under the old covenant, people were joined by birth. It was a national covenant for a national people. However, in the new covenant, people are joined by new birth. This has been understood historically. And again, this is why so many practice infant baptism who hold to baptismal regeneration. They at least understood the connection between regeneration and covenant membership. They believed that to be a part of the church, you had to be regenerated. So they baptized their infants and made them part of the church because they believe baptism created regeneration. To truly be a member of the new covenant, you're supposed to be born again. They recognized that, so they did it. This is one of the distinguishing attributes of the new covenant over and against the old. Everyone within the new covenant is a regenerate believer. Everyone who's truly in the New Covenant is a regenerate believer. The New Covenant is mentioned in the book of Jeremiah and is repeated and quoted in the book of Hebrews chapter 8. It's called the New Covenant because it is a better covenant with a better priesthood and better promises. I call it the Papa John's Covenant. Better priesthood, better better sacrifices, <laughs> New Covenant. It's the New Covenant 
that God has written on the heart. Everyone in the new covenant will have a genuine relationship with God. I will be their God. They will be my people. Everyone from the least to the greatest in the new covenant knows God personally. Every member of the new covenant has full forgiveness of sins. It will not be made up of those who confess faith and those who do not, but rather it will be made up entirely of professing believers. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 11 says, And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. This speaks specifically about the covenant community wherein all shall know the Lord. The Baptist position then is simple. A person does not enter the new covenant by birth. A person enters the new covenant by new birth. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. It is not physical birth that unites one to Christ. It is spiritual birth that unites one to Christ. And we see this clearly in John chapter 1, verse 11, in the prologue to John's gospel. It says in verse 11, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Notice that those who are given the right to become children of God, i.e. the new birth, have two distinguishing markers. Number one, they received him, and number two, they believed on his name. In addition, notice that John goes to great lengths to ensure that we understand how they are not born into God's family. They're not born into God's family by blood, they're not born into God's family by the will of the flesh, and they're not born into God's family by the will of man. It is not a physical nor a familial birth. It is a spiritual birth. Being born into a Christian family does not make one a child of God. This is why in the New Testament, you never read of the apostles purposefully baptizing an unrepentant unbeliever. Baptism is always given to those who profess faith in Christ. Likewise, there is no command, neither any explicit description of any infant being baptized in the New Testament. Households are mentioned to be certain, but there's nothing to say that those households contained infants. I have just as much warrant to believe that the people in the house of the Philippian jailer were all over the age of 12 as anyone has to assume that there were infants in the home. Using my church as a simple sample size, we have about 50 families in our church, and none of them have any infants right now. We have a few in diapers, but they're toddlers. They're not infants. Moreover, in at least one biblical case, we are told that the person believed together with his household and would be in line with our understanding of household baptism. This comes from Acts chapter 18, verse 8, where it says, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So finally, it's important to say that as a Baptist, I do not believe that my children are in the same condition as pagans, as is often suggested to malign us because the Bible tes, does teach that our children are sanctified by the presence of at least one believing parent. But that sanctification does not confirm them to be certainly among the elect any more than it does the sanctity provided to an unbelieving spouse, because that same verse speaks of an unbelieving spouse being sanctified. If this passage mandates baptizing an infant, it would also mandate baptizing an unbelieving spouse. Our children are in a position of privilege, to be sure, but they are not, by birth, members of the new covenant. And it does not make them part of the covenant community any more than it would an unbelieving spouse. Our children are blessed to be in a Christian home. Our children are blessed to be in the Christian church. But our children do not become part of the body of Christ apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And until they profess faith, they are not proper subjects of baptism. Thank you, and that ends my opening statement. All right. Thank you, Keith. Um, I, I appreciate you, you know, giving your opening statement. Uh, I was going, I forgot to say, I was going to say, don't respond yet, <laughs> but you didn't. So great job. And uh, I just wanted to play this as uh, you know, for everyone, you know, so congrats. Good job, Keith. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> um, thanks for being here. 
Um, yeah, so what I'm hoping now is maybe we can kind of do that idea of responding to one another um, and not doing it in such you know long stretches, maybe uh, as some debates do. But what we can do is, you know, have Daniel ask Keith a question, answer, discussion, have Keith ask Daniel a question, discussion. You know what I'm saying? So kind of kind of the cross-examination sort of thing, but a little bit like I said, more conversational. So um, if either of you guys have any questions right off the bat that, you know, maybe aren't uh, like, and maybe can lead to discussion, that'd be great. I'm going to also be flagging questions in the comments. So, and then Mason, do you have your own questions for us? I do have my own questions and uh, I'd love to ask one of them. Let me, let me pull it up. Yep. Yeah, so um, I'd love to know, you both kind of mentioned it, but baptism, it seems to be, is a uh, is an outflowing doctrine of other foundational doctrines. It's, it's uh, you know, it's crucial that, you know, we understand it as it is, but li like you both mentioned, there's a lot of presuppositions involved, a lot of things that... Uh, can lead us to a certain conclusion on baptism that you know are and baptism is kind of downstream so i would love to know like what do you guys think is uh the biggest presupposition or biggest foundation that kind of leads to a certain conclusion about baptism and i i before on the the, the pre-debate show i talked with the chat we had a couple in mind and so um after you guys go i'll kind of share with you what i'm thinking are some of the some of the bigger uh, presuppositions? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I would say <clears throat> it sounds like um, it sounds like the big, the bigger, the biggest issue um, would be that I I would see there being more continuity between the the covenants in the old into the new covenants. Uh, it, you know, in terms of inclusion of of uh, a wider number of people, whereas um, Keith sees a little more, I would say, discontinuity. Uh, the it's new, funny because yeah, I don't yeah. want to interrupt you, but I There's literally newness, wrote down yeah. I literally yeah. wrote down continuity versus discontinuity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> so it's funny that you say that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the like you know, it's like I said, it's like a matter of like how we read the Bible. I mean, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of commonality and there's a lot of like. Some of the things that you know, I'm sure we both said, we're like, okay, yeah, I can see how that fit even fits into my own system. Um, yeah, but I think that's the bigger, because to me, it's not about like the the particular passages necessarily. It's that issue of continuity, uh, discontinuity. So you know, you know, there like I, I would say like explicitly, we're told that there's a new temple. Explicitly, there's a new there's a new high priest, Jesus, right? Uh, sacrifices. Um, you know, there are certain things that are new and ch have been changed, uh, but I would say those things that haven't still continue. And so that issue of continuity of what a covenant is and, you know, to whom it applies is definitely probably the, for me the biggest issue. Do you want me to answer too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Keith. Sorry about that. I was muted. <laughs> No, it's fine. I, I'll I'll build on uh, what Brother Danny said. Uh, the is okay. Do you prefer pastor, brother? Uh, oh yeah, Dan, no, it's, Danny. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, so um, I think I think there is typically a distinction among Baptists and Presbyterians, a uh, a question of continuity and discontinuity. But it's also a question of promise and fulfillment. It's also a question of what we would call and and not not necessarily to be derogatory, but we would say. When we when you place everything from Adam to Christ at, under the covenant of grace, it ends up flattening out the covenants, and then it all becomes different administrations of one covenant of grace, which I think is the proper way to describe that. Danny, is that not the yeah. way? It, yeah. yeah. So, in that, we would see a, a distinction that each covenant reveals God and a, a pointing or reveals Christ, pointing to the new covenant, and the new covenant is the fulfillment of all of the preceding covenants pointing forward to him, the promise and fulfillment motif. So rather than saying they're all the same covenant, 
we would say each of the covenant progressively points to the new covenant, the great covenant of grace, which is how Baptists would understand the new covenant. Rather than seeing it all as the covenant of grace, we would say these other covenants point to the covenant of grace, which is the new covenant. So that would be the the way we see the discontinuity is more of progression. Yeah. And just to clarify, Keith, are you uh, kind of in the camp of like Stephen Wellam, uh, progressive covenantalism. That's kind of what I was hearing. Yeah, I would be more of a progressive covenantalist in that regard. Um, but I think that even within uh, the 1689 Federalist camp and things like that, they would still uh, yeah. see the new covenant as being the covenant of grace, not the covenant yeah. of grace throughout. Um, so that would be, a, I yeah. think, a consistent thing between us. And if And if I'm wrong, uh, I, 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 I will, I will repent in sackcloth and ashes and, and, uh, and uphold both the lesser and greater Renahan in, in my prayers. So, uh, no, I, I think you're correct. I, I, I have read their books and I think you're correct. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, even like, uh, in my doctoral dissertation, uh, on John Owen, uh, you know, I had to, I had to take into account, uh, uh, Sam, Samuel Renahan's dissertation on John Owen. Um, and, like, and this was like the big issue you know, in sort of like the minutia of, of John Owen scholarship, you know, is John Owen a proto-Baptist or not? Um, and so, yeah, that was the issue was like, you know, what is the covenant of grace, uh, continuity, discontinuity, but I, you know, just the way Keith described it, I mean, yeah, we would say similar, there is a, there is progression. The covenants do progressively get more clear uh, more information, you know, uh, there, there's more to it. And they're all pushing forward to uh, the new covenant. Um, I think the difference would be, you know, we would see the, the new covenant as it's still an administration of the one covenant of grace, uh, but there is newness. Like, so I don't want to discount that either. Like there is newness, like from from our, fan, you know, in the Dutch Reformed Church, like there's newness of the new covenant. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's probably like even how we read those things, I think they're probably, you know, we probably agree more um, than, you know, the typical, you know, Reformed Baptist, like, you know, throwing barbs at each other. I think we probably would agree more on that. Um, it's just so it probably comes down to even like, you know, like what's new about the new yeah. covenant, right? Like how much newness is there? So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You guys are, uh, you know, spot on with what kind of I was discussing with some of the people, uh, the audience, uh, we, we were thinking of just kind of the idea of covenant theology in general, but you guys yeah. kind of discussed a little bit more of the, the, the nuance of it. Um, then the other thing was kind of the hermeneutical uh, difference when it comes to, and you see the 1689 and the Westminster Confession side by side, you see uh, the, the 1689 removes the, the, clear and or what what is the good and necessary consequence uh yeah and in chapter and one so, yep. yeah chapter one like article three or six or something but yep. how do you guys uh what, what do you guys think of that well i know like ryan mcgraw who te who's you know uh, nlpc professor at greenville seminary ryan mcgraw has a little booklet on that on uh, good and necessary consequence and you know yeah that's explicitly taken out um I have to look at the Savoy Declaration, but for sure, yeah, the the 1689 London Baptist Confession, and I think that's probably the issue going on. It's not just infant baptism, right? But it's there's that like kind of looming in the background. But yeah, that's that's at least what McGraw argues. Uh, that's why that was, you know, kind of removed, edited out. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, unfortunately I can't speak to the reasoning behind that. Uh, our church actually holds yeah. to the first London Confession, not the second. Okay. So I've uh, done more study on the first, and so uh, I, I don't want to I don't want to speak out of uh, yeah. out of turn and, and yeah. be wrong. I, again, the Renahans are are you know they, they loom over my shoulder always. The lesser <laughs> and greater. I, I joke like it's it's Jim and Sam, but I say the lesser and greater Renahan are always there to uh, to that make sure funny. that I get it right as a Baptist. So I'm, I'm yeah. gonna be careful. Yeah. Yeah, and then the the third thing um, that we've been thinking about is like just baptism, the definition of it. You know, like I I uh, I think that when I was in seminary studying it, um, it, it seemed to me like there's just this disconnect. It's it just people, in a sense, there there's just different definitions. You know, like 
of course, the subjects of baptism are going to be different if you believe the definition itself is different. So I'd love to hear maybe like uh, just from you guys, I, I an elevator pitch uh, or, or just, you know, a very short summary of what is baptism? You know, like, what does it mean? I know you both kind of summarized it in your opening statements, but just for, for the person who maybe is has never studied it, maybe the person who uh, just became a Christian, um, how would you define baptism for them from your from your uh, perspective? Uh, whoever wants to go first um, is welcome to. Well, I, sure. I, I, I'm fine. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go, Keith, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, the, th this is where the, I think there can be some some difficulty because um, typically among Baptists, when we talk about what is the sign of the new covenant, uh, the the we talk about an, the internal sign of regeneration, but then the external sign is, of course participation in baptism because baptism is the is the sign of entrance into the new covenant community and we and I think I think uh both Danny and I would agree at least in in, in general on that definition yeah. that this is how we this is how we indicate someone is entering into the community and we would just differ on who that would be so um baptism is a is certainly a a sign it is a picture there is a picture given to us in Romans chapter 6 that that baptism is the sign of being buried with Christ and being raised to the newness of life to walk in him and to be united with him in his death burial and resurrection and so there is a, the the symbolism of baptism is is that and i know we're not debating tonight the mode of baptism or the method of baptism but there is a reason why baptists tend to focus on the laying the person back and immersing them in the water as a symbol of going into the grave and being raised with Christ and and so there are there are certain aspects of that that are that are symbolic and so we would say it is a, it is the initial sign of entrance into the new covenant community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and... Yeah. I mean, yeah, same. I was just going to read a couple lines from the Belgian Confession of Faith, 1561, um, you know, that virtually says that, uh, speaking of the sacrament of baptism, says, by it, baptism, we are received into God's church and set apart from all other people and alien uh, religions that we may be dedicated entirely to him bearing its mark and sign um, and then it says um, uh, that jesus has commanded all those who belong to him be baptized uh, in the name of the father and the holy spirit so yeah it's um i was gonna make a joke you know <laughs> people you, know, you hear people say like water baptism oh you gotta have you know you gotta you know you gotta you know believe in you know then you gotta you know have water baptism what other kind of baptism is there <laughs> like what is redundant like baptism is water so um so besides that right there's there's the elemental part of the of the sign uh the sacraments the ordinance um yeah it's it's the it's an outward tangible sign of inclusion in into the the people of god um, you know, like these are all loaded terms. Like, you know, when we understand the people of God, of course, yeah, we're thinking covenantally, we're thinking, you know, believers and their children. Um, but it's, you know, it's a generically same definition. Um, but it's, it's, there's also, I would say the the, the difference nuance too would be, um, it's not just, you know, it's not just incorporate, like, it's not just that the person is, you know, uniting themselves or the person is entering into the covenant, the church, the people, um, you know, there's, there's also from the reform point of view, uh, this is something that God does. That's why it's a sacrament, right? It's not just, an, it is an ordinance, right? Christ commanded this. That's, you know, it is an ordinance. Um, it's just not only an ordinance. It is a sacrament, meaning a, a holy sign and seal, um, uh, you know, in the road, like that's why that word was used. Sacramentum was used to to translate uh, to, to be the equivalent of musterion from the Greek, um, because it's it's not just the Roman soldier's oath of loyalty to his uh, to his uh, you know general uh, or Caesar. This is God. This is His oath to us. God has taken upon Himself in Christ uh, all the obligations of the covenant, and He's fulfilled them all for us. And so. Um, there, there's like there's a heavenly side to it, a divine side, like the divine initiative, the graciousness of reformed sacramental theology 
Um, so I'd say like on that little, on that point, you know, we would be more on the side of the Lutherans um, versus the Baptists because we see it more as God's action rather than the person's action. It is, right. it is our action. I mean, we have to do something, but it's also, it's God. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you for that. But in general, yeah, in general, I mean, you know, we'd have a similar like definition, but then, you know, it's like the devil's in the details. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, just, just like one politician just said, just become reformed and then we'll explain it to you afterwards. Right. So vote for me <laughs> first and then I'll explain it to you. <laughs> uh, that is funny. You've got to pass the bill to read the bill, right? Like that was the, that was the old, uh, the old term back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I have a couple more questions, but I'd love to, yeah. and I'm sure others would love to hear maybe you guys asking each other a couple questions, uh, and then going off of those, if you do have any, um, it sure. can be in, in, in response to the opening statements, or it could be just, you know, kind of a curiosity that you're hoping to discuss. Um, and then we'll take a couple, uh, questions from the chat. So, uh, so maybe just, I'll ask one, um, of key. So, so Jeremiah, uh, 31, Hebrews eight, uh, all in the new covenant are regenerated. Um, so how, so, so, you know, so, so how do you, you know, in particular, Keith, how do you take into account the Hebrew six then? Like, so make sense of that Hebrew six apostasy falling away, you know, what's going on there. Okay. So we would say that the only people who are truly members of the new covenant are in fact regenerate. But that is not to say that everyone who is in the visible community is regenerate because there are those who have made false professions. There's a difference between receiving someone upon the basis of a false profession and receiving someone who's never made a profession. So we would distinguish as as I'm, I'm sure the question implies, well, you, you're going to have people there who aren't genuinely part of the, or the of the covenant. Well, those people make themselves known by virtue of the fact that they uh, demonstrate their apostasy at some point. That's how they make themselves known. But the the infant who is baptized would be baptized based upon no expression of faith, no inclination of faith that we know of, because there's been no participation in their cognitive ability to believe and confess and receive Christ. So that would be the distinction. We would yep. say that no one is in the community who hasn't made a profession of faith. Not and that's and that's why I made a distinction at the beginning of yep. my introduction. It's not when we say credo baptism, some people call that believer's baptism. I actually don't use the term believer's baptism because we don't know if somebody's a believer or not, but we know if somebody confesses faith. That's what credo means. I believe. That's what they've said. That's who we baptize. That's who we accept in the covenant community. And so Hebrews 6 and other places would be identifying someone who has done those things, who has made those professions of faith, and later demonstrated themselves to be an apostate. So as a, so as a follow-up, because that's interesting. Um, so you've probably seen like or heard, you know, let me maybe sprawled or somebody like typically like, the ref, you know, we in the Reformed camp will make a like two concentric circles, right? There's the elect and then there's like the covenant, right? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you guys do the same thing. You just, the, you, you also make some kind of like concentric circle. Like there's the, the new covenant is the, is the small circle and the big circle is the church. Yeah. Yeah. We would say not everyone who's a member of the church is, okay. uh, is by yeah. de facto a spiritual member of the new covenant. Um, yeah. okay. but we don't yeah, do no, that on purpose. <laughs> yeah. That's not purposefully done. I was going to say like that when you when you were reading uh, when you were saying your opening statement that was like one of the things that struck me was like oh so you you guys all like so again like we like you too make some distinctions just like we do I mean obviously again it's like the members of the covenant church you know are going to be different but uh, I was just yeah it was interesting to me that you made like a similar conceptual argument that you know there's a new covenant that's this that that would be like equivalent to you know the elect. Uh, and then the church, the broader sphere, we would just call it the covenant, but you would say that's the visible church, right? Yeah, visible we would church? say somebody somebody can be a part of the visible church and yeah, not okay. genuinely be. But but again, it would be through the process of false profession, like Simon yeah. the the in Acts chapter 8, who professed and was baptized, but then later demonstrated himself to not be a genuine believer. Yep. Okay, so my turn? Do I get yep, to ask your it? Your turn, Keith. Yeah. All right, great. Well, I, I you know— 
I enjoy these types of conversations and, and, and uh, I, I like to ask questions. My, one of my favorite questions on this is in regard to first Corinthians chapter seven, because this is often yep. a passage that is used to, uh, to argue that, that children of, of believers are sanctified. So my question to you, Danny, is in regard to the other person who's mentioned in this, and this is the spouse who is the unbelieving spouse. Yep. Would it be your position that the unbelieving spouse is also a candidate for baptism, even though they don't believe? And if not, what would preclude them from being a candidate for baptism? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so I wouldn't, this is me personally, I would, I wouldn't say that, you know, like, that's not like a proof text. Like I would never say that's a proof text. I would just say like, it's one little piece of the puzzle. Right. And, and I didn't um, say that you did. I, I've oh, heard yeah. it from other yeah, people. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily, yeah. Yeah, I understand. No, like you. I hear like, you know, I had some friends text me today saying like, you know, <laughs> I'm still Presbyterian, but uh, you got to make some better sense of some of these texts for me. Cause I've heard some lame expla explanations lately. And one of them was like one Corinthians seven fourteen. So, and I said, you know, okay, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I'll say something interesting. Um, yeah, because I, I I think some people t turn to these passages and they kind of think of them as proof texts. Where I think you know, you and I are both probably saying something different to people. Like, hey, we got to read the Bible holistically and you know make sense of the pieces. But um, so what I would say, this is me saying this. You know, I don't know what others would say, but um, so the difference. So the difference would be. Um, that, and like the wife, you know, this, this is like a conscious adult. I mean, she's going to make sure he's going to make her his own, uh, you know, conscious decision. So, um, the sanctification does, uh, enter the household. It's a set apart household. And so, you know, we would been, we would baptize and we've done this. We have, we have, we've had split households and we've baptized the, the children. Um, but the person the, the 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 unbelieving spouse if that unbelieving spouse was you know consciously you know rejecting the gospel then yeah we would not baptize them uh because they've rejected the faith uh they haven't believed in the gospel because they're they're an adult like they're a different it's a different animal right it's a different status for us um uh, what if the person what if he was an unbeliever yep. but he wasn't opposed to being baptized to satisfy his wife would you baptize him then if he no. said, I don't, I don't believe, but she, it'll make yeah. her happy. So give yeah. me the water. Give me the water. <laughs> so, yeah. So like, again, like I, I'm pretty confident, like in our churches, no, that person would not be baptized because they're in a different situation. And like, there has to be a conscious profession of faith uh, on their, you know, for, for them. So, you know, and, you know, like I say, like to, to, to my Baptist friends, like, Hey, you know, we, we do believe in, you know, like in, in profession of faith, we do believe in credo baptism. It's just we also believe in infant baptism. So um, we we would want that person to be catechized, be evangelized, be taught. Um, yeah, and if they gave some you know minimal confession, sure, we baptize them. Uh, if they were just agnostic, no. If they rejected it, obviously not. Um, but I would still say though, um, you know, just as a bigger principle, like you know, as a pastor to people who've got who go through this. Um, you know, let's say it's the husband who's a believer. Hey, like, you know, there is a general sanctification uh, and through you, the Lord is going to, you know, we pray use you, uh, you know, in your wife's life or in the opposite situation. Um, you know, if the wife's a believer and the husband's not, it's the same thing. Like, um, you know, just like kind of the first Peter, you know, the wife trying to win over her husband, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that principle there's still a sanctification. We would still view them, you know, kind of household wise, but um, yeah, there is a difference between in that situation, the unbeliever and the, and the, and the believer, okay. uh, the a believer and the, and the child. So, yeah. Yep. All right. Is his turn again? Is he get to ask another question? Or yeah. Want... Yeah. Let's just go uh, yeah, back let's and, yeah, one more time back and forth and we'll see where we're at. Um, uh, I mean, I do. I just want to say like, as appreciation, you know, the, on the, on the one Corinthians seven fourteen when you, when you, when you mentioned that, uh, in your opening. Um, yeah, it's it, honestly, it's good to hear Baptist brothers say that their kids are different from the world's kids. <laughs> um, you know, so kudos on that. Uh, you know, cause the typical, like from our, from our side of the fence, like we like to lob the whole, like, Oh, you're, you know, you have little vipers and diapers. Right. So, 
Uh, I'm not going to say I've never said that phrase, but yeah, I get it. I, <laughs> I've heard Keith say our, that. Our vipers aren't as bad as their vipers. Okay, that's uh, what it is. <laughs> their fangs are a little less. So There's yeah, like cobras. Yours are just vipers. That's okay, right. I know Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards uses that phrase at times too. But uh, uh, yeah, no, I was just as a general, you know, again, uh, you know, it's not a hugely formal debate, and I think it's good for people to see that hey, we don't we don't agree. There's a reason why we have different denominations and different churches and associations, but at the same time, uh, you know, on that, it's good um, to hear that. So um, I guess, um, so the, okay, so back, yeah, back to the Jeremiah Hebrews, okay? <laughs> this is like one of the, obviously like one of the big texts, um, exegetical passages um, that, you know, we all, we wrestle over and, um, okay, so this is, I'll, I'll just tell you how, 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 how we would read it, you know, how I would read it. Um, and I guess there's a question implied in there. Um, so sometimes we hear like we're reading the old Testament prophets, um, you know, there's like the two horizons, right? So, oh, you know, the illustration, like, oh, I'm driving up to like big bear mountain in Southern California. And I think I see big bear mountain, but really there's a, that's the first mountain and big bears behind it. And there's a gap in between, right? So a lot of times like that kind of illustration helps us make the point of when we read the Old Testament prophets, um, there are there are things that are like already in application, uh, in operation. And there are things though still that are to come. Um, and this is, you know, I'm just curious, like how you, when you read that passage, like, do you read all the prophets that way? Like everything that they say about the new covenant is already like in operation. Um, you know, cause Jesus talks about like, there's two comings, right. And the Jews were stumbled by that, you know, Matthew 24, um, you know, the, the, the sometimes uh, the apostles quote from a text from the old Testament prophets and uh, they stop. They don't quote the whole thing because the next verse goes on to talk about like the day of wrath, the day of the Lord. And, so there, there's a conscious understanding that some things, yes, are happening now and other things aren't. And so I guess I would read the Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8, um, you know, in that line of like, kind of put it in Pauline terms, like there's this age and there's the age to come. And so in this age, the new covenant has been inaugurated, um, but there's also like, an eschatological age to come, like a finality to it, when it will be true that, you know, nobody's going to need a teacher. They're all going to know the Lord. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, that's just my observation. Uh, I know we disagree on that, but, um, you know, is there any sense of like those kinds of new covenant prophecies in the Old Testament prophets are there things that are still not happening, like in terms of the covenant? Well, I, I think my my answer, I, I I wouldn't say that there is no uh, forward-looking promise or yeah. anything like that, but I would say that within the context of uh, Hebrews 7, 8, 9, all of those, we're looking at the work of, of what Christ did uh, in, in coming and inaugurating the new covenant and making the old covenant obsolete. That's the point of Hebrews 8 is that the reason he speaks of a new covenant is because he has made the old covenant obsolete and what is obsolete is growing old and is beginning to vanish away and and we see that of course when the when the temple is destroyed in AD 70 that brings about the the final death nail of the old covenant where there's no more sacrifices there's no more priesthood there's no more place to produce the sacrifices so we see that happening so i do think it is in that sense time bound to the events that happened in the first advent i don't think it's i don't think it's a promise that has only fulfillment in the in the second advent. I think there is a fulfillment in the first advent, and the fulfillment is that we have this new covenant that's going to include people that aren't just Jewish, but are of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And the distinction between this and the old covenant is the old covenant is a mixed covenant, which included Jewish people who were believers, not believers, and the new covenant will be a covenant of believers from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And so that's the that's the promise and fulfillment that I would see there in Hebrews eight. Okay. Yeah. That, that's helpful. Um, but then how, so I guess my follow-up then, I, it goes back to the earlier question. Um, so how would you, like what distinction are you making then saying that Hebrews 8, you know, the, the new covenant is in all the, all the aspects of Jeremiah 31 are in operation 
you know, now, according to Hebrews 8, in terms of the new covenant, the newness being not a mixed covenant, um, all are regenerated. Um, well, but are they, the, so they are, have their sins forgiven. They've all, they, yeah. they all know the Lord. And by all know the Lord, it says no one will have to tell his neighbor, know the Lord. Yeah. That, that's not saying that there never has to be a teacher in the church or anything sure, like that, sure. that, that you and I be put out of a job. But what it means is the people <laughs> who are in the church are, um, are there because they believe this is the, this is why, this is why they gather. They gather because they, they know the Lord. And so, so, what, it's, so like what, what in Hebrews six, seven, eight, like would, would lead you to say that like the Hebrews six person is not like a member of the new covenant. They're just okay. like in the church. He, like, he, we... he has experienced the, the, the participation in the new covenant by having received the sign of baptism, having tasted of the heavenly gift, which I do believe is participation in the Lord's Supper. I think he has experienced those things, but has done so under the false veil of professing to be a believer when he was not. And this is why the writer of Hebrews goes on to say in Hebrews 6, but we think, but we know better of you, speaking of the true believers who are reading and hearing, which I believe is a sermon that was written, uh, sure. Hebrews is a, a sermon, he's saying, but, but we know better of you at, right after he finishes the apostasy, apostasy passage in, in verses, I think it's four to six in Hebrews six, right after that, but we think better of you. Why? Who is the you? It's the, it's the, it's the genuine believers. It's the genuine members of the covenant, the ones who have not had this false veil of, of, of faith, which was not real. All right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that leads, uh, do I get to ask a question now? My yeah. turn. Okay. All right. So um, this is this is a simple question, but I, but if if you would indulge me, <laughs> if you would indulge me, I'd like to have a follow up. But, but because the first sure. question is really just a yes or no question, and then based on your answer, I'll ask a follow up. Do you believe that the new covenant is what what I would define, and you may not use the same term, but what we would define as a mixed covenant? That the new covenant includes believers and unbelievers. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. I, I thought so. I, I, that's why I said yeah. I figured it was a yes yeah. or no answer. Okay. So when the writer of Hebrews tells us that the new covenant makes the old covenant obsolete, what's obsolete? Well, yeah. I mean, that's like. So what's obsolete is. Um, especially dealing like with that passage going back to her. I'm just trying to pull it up real quick. Um, so yeah, like, so the Hebrews eight pointing to Jeremiah 31, which is pointing back to, of course, um, uh, like Mount, Mount Sinai, right. Um, the day that he brought them out of Egypt. Um, so, you know, obviously like we have different understandings of the Mosaic covenant, the covenant, you know, through Moses at Sinai. Um, but yeah, the, I would say that the newness in this context, the newness, um, it, again, is like there's an already not. Oh, I think we just lost Mason. Did we lose Mason? I was going to say um, we lost our moderator. Now we can fight. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah bring, out, bring out the, the boxing gloves. Um, so yeah, there, the newness would be, first of all, um, that covenant at Sinai, obviously, like there at a minimum, there's like some legal aspect to it. Uh, there's some obedience aspect to it. However, we construe that. Like some people, of course, have historically said it's like uh, strictly come to works. Uh, it's a mixed covenant, covenant of grace and works. Um, you know, or it's an administration of one coming to grace with a legal aspect. That's typically how I would understand it. Um, so you know that that is stripped off um obviously like temple apparatus like you mentioned earlier um it's fulfilled obviously uh it doesn't cease so it, the the jewish temple ceases and the priesthood and sacrifices cease but we still have a temple um the church is the temple uh the 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 people are the priesthood uh, christ is the great high priest uh we lay ourselves down as sacrifices we offer up sacrifice of praise so I would say those things are those things are ceased, but they're also redefined. Re, you know, they're brought to their fullness. 
um, you know, the purpose of God dwelling with his people in the temple is now reality um, without a physical temple. Um, so, um, yeah. And, but then again, I would say like some of the, some of these things, just like in other passages in the prophets, um, there are aspects that are all lumped together in one passage that I, I would say have to be carefully delineated out in terms of, okay, uh, in this part is not, this part is not necessarily speaking of this age. It's speaking of the the consummation of the new covenant. So I guess that, like, that's why I brought the Hebrews six up because I would say like the, based on Hebrews six existing um, shows us that like, um, you know, they're all going to know the Lord. That language is in the same context of this new covenant prophecy, but not all of the new covenant prophecy is, you know, in, in, in operation, you know, in all of its fullness yet. So, you know, that's how, at least I would understand that, um, you know, in, I, I guess just to kind of point people to something to read on that, um, my old Testament professor, one of them back in seminary, uh, Meredith Klein, uh, in his explanation of, uh, the Jeremiah 31 passage would, would make that distinction between like this age and the age to come, the Pauline distinction. Um, so some, some things are operative, um, for, forgiveness of sins. Um, but yet, you know, are all regenerated? No, not until the consummation. So yeah, that, that's how we would understand those, te those texts because Hebrews six is there. Like we would not see them as like distinct texts of like different, like those people are in the covenant. We would say they're in the same assembly because like, so we don't make this distinction between church and covenant, right? It's the same, like the church, visible church is the sphere of the covenant. So you know, again, it goes back to the earlier like discussions. Just you know, we have a different delineation of like the narrow and the broad. So for us, the church is the covenant. The, the elect is the narrower circle, whereas the church slash covenant uh, is the broader circle. So, but even if one were to, and if I might push just a, yep. a, an inch, even if one were to accept that premise and say the church equals the covenant community. Um, what what justification then do we still have to bring people into that covenant community who have not made a profession of faith? Well, yeah, so that we I I would say like the quote unquote proof texts for ba infant baptism are Genesis 17, like our historic reformed like the form that we read every time we do a baptism uh, explicitly links it back to Genesis 17 because again we see that continuity. Genesis 17, Acts 2, like we're see, we see these things as essentially saying the same thing. The sign has changed, but the essential character that we, which we agree on, like this is the sign of entrance in, into the covenant, but we see that as still being applied to believer, professing believers, uh, and all those within their household. Um, so that's how, and and that's why we, that's how we bring them in. That's that's why we have, we feel like we have justification because we don't think that that promise of Genesis seventeen has ceased. Okay, I yep. I have a lot more, but I'll I'll leave it. That. <laughs> All right, yeah. Let's go to a couple of viewer questions. I gotta come to Florida. We got we gotta hang out and hash. Yeah, do hey, you come down here. I'll buy you a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Uh, part two. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Some of them are pointed towards uh, one of you. Um, okay. And then and then I'll ask a couple more questions and then uh, you guys can do your closing statements. Um, yeah. So this first one is from Blake and I'm assuming it's uh, it's pointed towards uh, Keith. Um, the question is, were people in the Old Testament saved by a different means than the New Testament? The people in the Old Testament and the people in the New Testament are both saved because of the work of Christ. Um, but but we would we would say that the people in the Old Testament are looking forward to the work of Christ. We look back to the work of Christ, but yep. all are saved by the same work of Christ. Yep. Yep. Beautiful. Simply put. That's that's what I that's like. what Jesus says, right? Like Abraham yeah. saw my day and rejoice. You know. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, 
This one is for uh, Danny. Yep. Can you clarify what you mean by one covenant of grace? What is essential to the covenant of grace that is true of all the various administrations? I don't know if you see that so, on the screen, but. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see that. I see that. So, um, first of all, shout out to, to, to Libby, former member of Oceanside URC. Um, uh, yeah, one covenant of grace. So, you know, that's that's a theological term um, like Trinity. It's something that we use, you know, as a, as a kind of a catch all, you know, terminology to help us make sense of a lot of biblical material. So when we talk about God being a covenant God and making covenants all throughout the Old Testament, um, you know, there's God initiated, there's parties to the covenants, so there's God who initiates and there's the the person or the people with whom he's making the covenant um covenants so there's parties um there's uh promises right so in the garden there's a promise uh implied by the threat so there's promises and threats the threat is you know if you eat the day that you eat you'll surely die uh the implied promise is obviously if adam obeys he's going to live um so there's threats there's promises and uh, there are also signs so in we would say in the garden, uh, tree of life is a sign of that life. Um, later on, of course, with, um, with 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 Abraham, the sign is circumcision. There's still the Lord. There's Abraham uh, and the nation that he's going to build through Abraham. Those are the parties. Uh, the promises, uh, I'll be your God to be my people. Uh, there there are threats uh, for those who aren't circumcised or cut off. So there's a threat. Um, yeah, so you know those those are the kinds of like details that make up covenants. Um, could be missing one or two, but you know those are the general parameters. And so when we re read all these covenants, um, how do we make sense of them all? Well, the covenant of the covenant with Adam, we would say, is qualitatively different. It's something else going on. Uh, it's not a covenant of grace. It's it's a covenant of works or of life or creation various terms uh, that are used for that. Um, but after that, when Adam falls, like the promise of God bringing salvation, uh, Genesis 315, that little mother promise, as we call it, uh, takes on shape and takes on like, you know, more detail, more interesting, you know, nuances, you know, as it comes through uh, Abraham, I'm kind of, I'm skipping the Genesis uh, six, seven, eight, nine with Noah, because it's kind of a, a, a different thing. But um, uh, the, pro the the covenant that God makes with the Israelites, uh, the, pro the then he adds to that even like through David of kingship, um, then the promise of a new covenant to come. So all those all those individual covenants, Abraham, Israel, David, new covenant. Um, you know, we would put them all under the heading, sort of theologically speaking, to kind of make sense of it all as God administering a covenant of grace. Uh, to save sinners. So that's why I said the Bible is all about God saving sinners. Um, there's lots of differences. Obviously, the covenant with, as I mentioned earlier, the covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, we would say it's a part of the covenant of grace, but there's a lot of differences, right? It has a work, there's work stuff attached to it. Um, it's very legal, like the law. Um, but anyways, yeah, those are kind of the aspects of covenants, parties, you know, threats and promises, signs, um, and all those different covenants we can kind of subsume after the fall uh, into you know the theological shorthand as you know the one covenant of grace, but trying to recognize like there's a lot of discontinuities as well and a lot of shape and form to each one. All right, thank you. Um, here's a here's a question from Angelo, and it's uh it's for both of you. It's I would say Keith first. Um, if a person was baptized when he, she was an infant in a Roman Catholic church for Keith, will they baptize him again when he joins the church or profess professes his faith? Yes. Yes. I, I, I can explain why, but the, but the answer is if, <laughs> if, a, if, a, if a person, uh, because our, according to our confession and our, um, actually our church constitution, is that church membership requires a, a baptism, which is uh, preceded by a confession of faith. 
So um, wouldn't matter if it's Roman Catholic or any any form of infant baptism. But specifically, because we believe Rome is um, does not can, preach the gospel, we would say that would be a, a, even more so a reason to emphasize the need for for proper baptism. All right, thank you. And I'm curious, did, Danny, would you would you rebaptize someone who was Roman Catholic, or would would you not? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, so, yeah, that's like in the in the in the history of the Reformation. Like, as far as I know, there was like one Dutch Reformed guy. Uh, I think it was Franciscus Unius who disagreed on that one. But for the most part, like the majority report is that we accept that baptism. Um, because although the Roman Catholic Church is is you know at a minimum a false church, it's not it's not the false church. Um, there's still uh, like vestigia gratiae. There's still vestiges of grace. Uh, you know the word is read. If the creed is recited, there are prayers. Uh, surely mixed with stuff. But baptism is one of those things that we would say is still legit because it's in the name of the Trinity in a triune confessing church um and it's it's with water of course it goes without saying um because the problem is and this is like more like me as a his, the historical nerd um the, the problem is in the reformation i would still say it still it would be true today um if all those baptisms were illegitimate like did the church exist for for 1500 years right like that was the problem that the reformers had to grasp with and so, you know, right or wrong, they tended to say, as Calvin and others did, that we accept Roman baptism uh, because we believe that God still was preserving the church, although through times of error. Now, in the United States, of course, like in Southern Presbyterianism back in the day, uh, that became like a hot, hot button, hot topic. And so, um, you know, there, there are major, you know, Southern Presbyterian theologians in the 18th uh, or 19th century. Uh, and following that would say, no, we need to rebaptize them. So uh, I, I know at least like, you know, my Presbyterian friends, OPC, PCA, mostly the OPC guys, that would be kind of a di like they'd have this divisions over that, like distinct views of that. In our churches, I'm pretty sure we would all accept them. So that now, uh, but I'll, I'll just kind of caveat that just to assuage people's consciences. Um, if a Mormon showed up and was converted, yes, rebaptism because they don't believe in the Trinity. Um, you know, yeah, if a one is Pentecostal, of course, uh, rebaptism, you know, whatever it might be, uh, disciples of Christ, right? Like only in Jesus name, um, rebaptism, like you haven't been baptized. So yeah, we would like, so on some things we'd agree again, but we would see on other things we, yeah, we have di big dif uh, disagreements. So, um, yeah. And if a Baptist comes, comes, we won't rebaptize them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to be clear, even though I was brought up in the Disciples of Christ Church, I was baptized as a Baptist. So, yeah. yep, good. Uh, yeah, so I have a couple, uh, just a couple more. And sure. um, first, I, yeah. I, can I say while you're looking, ahead, I just yeah. want to say I'm having a great time, Danny. You, you're such a great. <laughs> enjoyable person. Um, I, 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 I'm not saying that to, it just struck me that I'm enjoying this. I don't always do yeah. debates, but I'm enjoying this one. So Good. praise the Lord. Praise yep, the Lord. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this one is for Keith. Um, and it's, it's one that someone asked, I'm going to reword it basically. Um, so thinking of, you know, the new covenant as a better covenant mm -hmm. when it comes to membership in the covenants, I'm trying to see how to word it to be this, for this question. How is it better if it leaves out our children? Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I think the question's getting at like in, in Jeremiah 31, um, you know, it's, it's better. And yeah. uh, I, I think that the critique that I might be reading is like, the idea of it being more restrictive rather than better. And so uh, I'm just going off the top of my head now, but like I've, I've heard someone say like, Oh, I, I, if, you know, if uh, kind of the, the Baptistic understanding of the covenants is true, I kind of wish I lived in the old covenant in a sense, because, you know, my children would have at least been included. 
Uh, I think that's, you know, obviously, you know, kind of a ex- extreme it's being, saying. Yeah, it's it's making a, 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 a using hyperbole to make an exaggerated yeah. point. Yeah, I, I yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I guess how would you uh, respond to that kind of critique of, well, it's better, so therefore it should probably be, you know, seem better to the people who it was promised to. Uh, and I, I think I know where you're going to go, but I'd love to I'd love to hear you. Well, I'm, the reality of it is it's it's better because God says that it's better and God gets to define <laughs> his go. terms. And so uh, if if God says that this is better, it's it, it is simply by virtue of the fact that God knows all things. But True. it's also better in the sense that um, my children get to experience growing up in a Christian home. They get to experience growing up in a Christian church, and they get to experience the blessing of being evangelized into the faith, not being assumed that they are in the faith. And so my children receive from me the the call of, of faith in the gospel uh, on a regular basis and a pointing to Christ and with the hope and prayer that God will, in fact, regenerate their heart and bring them to saving faith. And so it, it, it's not as if they are somehow not a part of what we're doing and we we hide them in a closet on Sunday morning and don't let them come and participate in anything. No, they get to be a part of it, but we don't assume that they are a part of it simply by because they are born of the flesh. And again, this goes back to John 1, which I, I think is huge, John 1, 11, that they're, they're not, it's not of the flesh, it's not of the will of man, it's not of the will of the flesh, but it's of God. And so we tell our children, yes, they, you, you very much are part of the family of God when you believe. And until you believe, you are still in our family, and we're going to continue to encourage you to believe. Just, just last week, my seven-year-old daughter, was she six? She's fixing to be seven. She came up and she hugged me and she said, Daddy, I want to be baptized. And I said, praise God that at six years old, she can express that desire. And it wasn't something that I assumed upon her, but rather it's something she desires in her heart. And we're going to continue to encourage that desire in her heart and um, and, we'll, and we will baptize her. But it, but. It, We'll talk more. We another time we can talk about the things that go into that in the same way that I'm sure Danny would would have a time of 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 catechism and things prior to yep. the Lord's Supper. We would do the same thing yeah. prior to baptism. But but it's um for for us it's a blessing to see our children request this thing and to to desire it. So that that that's a I don't think that's missing out. Yeah. Thank you. That no, that was a good answer. Um... I have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, there's a lot of questions in the chat. Um, some of them are repeating. Um, I want to, whoa, that not meant to go up, but. Um, can, we, can we see those or no? Yeah. Oh, uh, the chat. You can, you can go on to the, the oh, uh, channel comments. on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. The okay, comments. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, cool. So there's a question. I can't I reach my for... computer, so I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I have long arms. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just looking up the question for for Danny. Um, and this is a question I heard uh, IRL in real in real life. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go to a couple of my questions. And it's it's it has to do with uh, one of the three forms of unity. Um, I don't remember exactly if it's the Belgic Confession or the Heidelberg Catechism, but basically uh, the the question I recently heard um, was in regards to infant baptism and the Dutch Reformed and Presbyterian uh, camps acknowledging there is some sense of like there's a promise of faith um, and, and there's an there's a connection of uh of the sacrament to faith um mm-hmm. and i i think the question that i've heard has to do with uh why doesn't the timing uh like i'm trying i'm sorry why doesn't the timing need to be in the successive order in you know in the way in which a baptist like keith might say oh well there needs to be this ordering uh, of of sequences um uh so the, so the question is 
like in terms of the relationship between baptism and faith, why, why is it that way or why? Yeah. Like, or, or, okay. Um, so let me just, I'll just read like a, I mean, there's a, there's a lot there, but. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. Me, I'm, I'm not. No, 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 very good of... I mean, like that gets to like, yeah, it's a huge issue of like the issue of from our vantage point, like the efficacy of baptism and how the sign relates to the seal. Um, yeah, the relationship between faith and the sign um, within the covenant and that kind of thing. So um, I'll just I'll just read a little bit, a, a little a couple lines or two here. Um, so, yeah, and that's in the Dutch Reformed Church churches. Um, you know, these issues have obviously been perennial issues, and not just in our churches, but you know, in Reformed churches in general. Um, so back in the day, uh, there was a Dutch Reformed theologian, a lot of people heard of him, Herman Witsius, Witsius um, and uh, he wrote a treatise on the, the efficacy, like the, you know, the power of baptism, right? Like how uh, its effectiveness, its power, you know, what does it do? Um, and he recognized back, you know, tracing the history of the Reformation, that there's lots of different views of, of these things. Um, so like even within our camp, you know, our little like bubble, we have diversity of opinions on like how those things relate faith and the sacrament and so forth. So, you know, Witsius, Witsius said, um, you know, there, there are some that believed in baptism regeneration. Um, he's not keen on that. So he's always arguing against that one. But uh, there are some that believe that uh, the blessings of God, salvation, happen before baptism so when a child is baptized some would some argued that there was at minimum a seed of faith already like in the child i'm not really satisfied by that answer i just don't, I just don't find it in the bible <laughs> kind of a big deal as ron burgundy once said um you know it's not in the bible it's kind of a, it's kind of hard to argue it's kind of hard to argue but it's in the bible um, okay you win the debate you quoted ron burgundy i, 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 I concede i lose <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, I'm, like, that's... I, I'm expecting uh, Mr. Presbyterian and, and uh, Superior Theology to quote Ron Burgundy in the next uh, the next video. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so Vinci has said, hey, you know, there are some that say like around the time of baptism, the the blessings come, and others say it's like afterwards. So, point being, like, there's not a unanimous uh, unanimous opinion on that. Um, and so, like, much later in history, in the year 1905, the Dutch Reformed churches, that Abraham Kuyper and Herman Babink. Uh, were a part of uh, the Netherlands. Again, this was a big issue. Um, there was lots of controversy over it. And so there was a synod, a gathering of Reformed churches in the Netherlands. Um, and they said a few things that I think are helpful um, on that, uh, which is this. Um, it says, first of all, according to the confession of our churches, so how to catechism, Belgian confession, Kansas and Dart, uh, the seed of the covenant by virtue of the promise of God, must be held to be regenerated and sanctified in Christ uh, until upon growing up, they should manifest the contrary in their way of life or in doctrine. So, yeah, we, we don't baptize because we think our kids are regenerated uh, or that we presume it uh, or that they're elect. No, we do it because we believe that they're in the covenant. Uh, there's a promise of God attached to that covenant. And so we have a judgment of charity, we would say, um, that we, we view our children as Christians, you know, ge at least at least ge generically speaking, um, and we pray for them, we catechize them, we expect them to repent and believe um, every day. Um, we expect them to come to some conscious point when they like, hey, I've always trusted in Jesus, but I, but I, you know, I, but I've given my life to Him. Um, so, uh, and then they go on to say, um, uh, this is why, like this judgment of charity in terms of our children it was in this covenant. Um, it doesn't imply that each child is actually born again uh, because not all Israel are Israel, but it says it's imperative in the preaching constantly to urge earnest self-examination since only he that believeth and is baptized um, shall be saved. Um, so, uh, and then one last, one last little line here and I'll kind of wrap it up. Um, so it says the synod is of the opinion that the representation that every elect child is on that account already in fact regenerated even before baptism can't be uh, can be proven neither on scriptural nor confessional grounds. So you know 
we, we don't think that every, you know, we're not, we're not Lutherans, right? We're not Roman Catholics, we're not Lutherans, okay? Um, that's like the shorthand answer. Um, God fulfills, here's what, and here's why. God fulfills his promise sovereignly in his own time, whether before, during, or after baptism. So like if somebody asks me, you know, pastor, what is our view? What's your view, you know, of when do all these blessings of God come? You know, so what, what's the relationship in time between the sign of baptism and, you know, faith and all the blessings being appropriated by faith? And I would say my answer is uh, before, during, and after baptism. We don't know. Um, and I would say, you know, tongue in cheek, and I've said this many times in the pulpit, you know, we're Calvinists. We believe in the sovereignty of God. Um, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it's our, we believe it's our, our responsibility to apply the sign to all of the covenant, and we let God do his work. So we pray for our kids. We teach our kids. We teach them the Bible, take them to church. We evangelize our kids. I would say, I'd say we evangelize our kids. Um, there, we need to call our kids to faith and repentance every single day. Uh, we need to model the Christian life. We need to be good parents and actually be godly, loving parents and not just tell them to do, you know, do as they say, not as they do. Um, so, yeah, there's not like a short answer to that. It's, yeah. it's one of the hardest pastoral questions to deal with. But yeah, we believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We trust God to use the means of parents to be examples, to pray, to teach and to hear the pastor preach in a way that, you know, is communi can, can communicate to children as well. So. You know, we address children in our sermons all the time. So Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, kind of going off of that, I'd love to to spin that and ask a question to Keith. Uh, I, it's kind of something I, I provided to you, but what does the process look like uh, with children in your church? What is the process um, for them growing up in the church and kind of uh, baptism in the future? What What does that whole process look like? That's a great question. And, uh, or did you have, I was going to say like, it's kind of like right in your, in your life right now with your daughter, you know, like what is the yeah. process? Yeah. So Year, years ago, I, I wrote an article entitled when should little Johnny be baptized because of this very <laughs> question. And it was an article that wasn't published or anything. It was just for our church members. It was sort of answering this question. And I would say we follow a very similar path to how a Presbyterian would, would prepare their child for the table in the sense that you would you would be looking for a profession of faith you would catechize the child to make sure they understand the faith and can and can articulate what they believe and uh in doing so you are you you you're not proving that they are a believer but you are demonstrating that they understand what it means when they say i believe and uh we talk about a credible profession of faith and an uncredible or incredible profession of faith would be one that doesn't understand the faith. And so we would want to make sure that the child understands as much as they can about those things and also about what it means to actually follow Christ and um, that that Christ is now when we when we profess Christ as our savior, he tells us that he he must take first place in our life. And that means he's actually going to have the place of preeminence, even over mommy and daddy, even over sister and brother, that that, that Christ is is in first place. And that sometimes is hard uh, for a young person to understand because the, the, the most important person in a young person's life is mommy and daddy. And so um, that's a difficult one to 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 help them understand. And, and I'm not saying they have to understand it perfectly. None of us had perfect faith when we were baptized. None of us had perfect repentance when we came to faith. And so we're not looking for perfection, but we are looking for an understanding that they would have very similar to how you would want the child to understand before participating in the Lord's Supper. All right. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, as you were talking, another question very related to that came in for Keith. I'm going to do kind of a snake sort of, you know, snake draft sort of thing where go to Keith again and then back to <laughs> Daniel, Danny for the closing uh, statement. If okay. that's good with you guys. And then, yep, yep. So, we, and then, uh, and then Keith can close us out. Um, but th this is a difficult one, Keith. Uh, but I, it's basically the question of, uh, like mental capacity. Uh, do you see it? Yeah, so, I do. And, 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 um, this is a difficult question. Uh, I have a daughter who's autistic, uh, and thanks be to God. 
she is what's known as high functioning autism. So she does have very strong cognitive abilities. She understands the world sometimes much better than I do because she's very intelligent. But because of her autism, we have had the experience of going to uh, the Center for Autism Research, which is here in Jacksonville, and meeting a lot of families whose children do not have the um, do do not have the ability to speak. That's a very yeah. common thing among autistic children is is being what's called nonverbal. Um, some children that aren't able to communicate at all with their parents, and that one it's is a very difficult thing. And I and I've and I've sought to minister to families who've been in this situation, and I've, I've sought to to love them and show them the greatest kindness that that I could, and and loving them with the gospel and pointing them to Christ. Um, I would I would this this is this is a very difficult pastoral question. I would not forbid a child to be baptized um, whose parents wanted him to be baptized in that condition, but I would also not um, tell them that it was required. It would be something that would be a pastoral conversation between me and the and the and the and the parents, and for the good of the child, we would do what we came to the conclusion that we thought was right. Um, but I cannot say yeah. that in every situation it would be the same, and that every because every child with cognitive dif- difficulties does have different levels of ability of understanding. We we have a young man who's autistic in our church who just got his brown belt in karate from me. But he has autism. So, so again, uh, this is a difficult yeah. pastoral question that I cannot simply give a yeah a no, simple I, answer of yes or no one way or the other. Yeah, well, that makes total sense. I the only reason I put it that was because we were kind of on the topic of no. Of I'm I'm glad you asked. I'm glad baptism. I got to speak to that because that yeah. that's one that is sometimes used as a as a as a as a I don't want to say a weapon against Baptists, but it's like well, you Baptists don't love children with mental disabilities and and nothing is further from the truth but yeah. again when people are being ugly like again i'm so thankful danny and i are able to have a conversation that's loving and brotherly and not that way uh, oh response. no i was just gonna say yeah we have this you know we deal with the same pastoral uh struggles about you know cognition or you know different kinds of um you know ailments you know yeah whether it's autism or other kinds of um you know learning impairments we don't deal, deal with it with baptism, of course, but it's the same problem for communion. So, you know, for us, our children are baptized, then they're, you know, they grow up in church, they're catechized, and then they have to make profession of faith before they can partake of the Lord's Supper. So, you know, we have the same kinds of, um, you know, yeah, it's tough, but it's always like for us, it's a judgment of charity. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, too, like we're, we're Calvinists and we don't think that the sacraments are, are you know, absolutely necessary for salvation. Amen. Yeah. Right. So, Amen. you know, yeah. or, you yeah. know, so all these like discussions we're having, it's like, you know, okay, well, ordinarily, like ordinarily. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, ordinarily, this is true, but you know, there are exceptions that we have to deal with and they're tipped and they're hard. So, yeah. All right. So I have to ask one more ca- question for, for Daniel now. Uh, it's yep. a little bit, it's, it's another, okay. I gave a kind of a fastball to Keith. I want to give a kind of a fastball to, to <laughs> Danny. Um, it just came into my mind. It's something I, I, I see online a lot. But um, so I don't know if there's a if there's a connection between this, but it seems to me that there's a lot of people going from like kind of a, you know, Calvinistic Baptist sort of camp into uh, churches like the CREC where there's, you know, pedo communion. And I I know it's not we're not discussing pedo communion right now, but um, I'm curious, like for those people who might be a little bit more uh, like black and white where it's a little bit more clean cut if you're a reformed Baptist or a little bit more clean cut if you're a CREC uh, when it comes to membership. Like we've been talking about the whole, whole evening, like the new covenant membership. That's a, that's a kind of one of the underlying issues here. Uh, So what, what does it mean for you that these children are baptized into the church, but they're uh, maybe a non-communicant member. I've heard that term. Um, So what, what is, uh, how are they, how are they a member of the church, but also not fit to partake of one of the sacraments? Yeah, I mean, we would say that all baptized children are members of the church, but we would make obviously distinction um, due to their age and ability and that kind of thing. You know, a communicant and a non-communicant, um, you know, a, even my own congregation, we have communi- communicant members, 
non-communicant, meaning, you know, mostly children. Um, but then we also have voting members, like, you know, just because you're a, you can be a community, you can community, uh, you can profess faith and be uh, welcome to the Lord's Supper at 10 years old, 12 years old, whatever, but we don't allow children to vote in congregational meetings till they're 18. So, um, yeah, we make distinctions as well bet between different people. Um, so how are they, you yeah. know, are, yeah, they're, 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 they are in the covenant. They are members um, of the body. Um, they, they hear the gospel preach. They participate in the liturgy and the, the worship. Um, they, uh, you know, in our church, parents, we, we, we walk up for the Lord's supper and receive it and parents bring their kids. Um, uh, they don't take it, but they come up with them just to, you know, come and see and learn like what it's like. And, you know, we, we hope that that also helps them to see the value of it and some desire for it. So, um, but there's a dif there's a difference, you know, between historic reformed practice and, you know, the churches that do practice paid communion. Um, you know, it's 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 a unanimous practice that we baptize, we catechize, then you profess and then you commune. Um, that's that's the pattern. Um, and we see it like in the Heidelberg Catechism when it asks, you know, who should come to the Lord's table? Uh, and it tells us that it's those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, yet who trust in Christ, that their sins are forgiven, uh, and that who desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a, uh, a better life or a new life. So there, there is something going on in 1 Corinthians 11 about, uh, about uh, you know, conscious understanding, yeah. discerning, discerning the body, yeah. that discerning the body is like, you know, it's been in modern uh New Testament studies, it's been like horizontalized, um, sort of egalitarianized um, to mean like, oh, you, you discern that you're, you know, like it's a horizontal body that's being described, um, mm. you know, it, not the body of Christ, right? That's the historical, like exegetical understanding of that text. So anyways, um, no, they, they, we, we, ha we have people that bring these questions up, obviously. Yeah. Um, and you know, try to deal with them and explain to them like the meaning. So, you know, and I would say to anybody in that, in that camp um, who wants to know more, you know, why we do it the way we do it. Um, there's a book by Cornelis Venema. I believe it's published by Reformation Heritage Books, RHB, uh, on this very question of pedo communion, you know, can my children come mm -hmm. to the Lord's Supper? So, um, yeah. 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 I know another one is uh, by, Robert Lethem, so Breaking the Bread, okay. I think, small, okay. small book. It's just yeah, those books are important because, you know, there, there was a book written, you know, a while back. Um, it was like, you know, Daddy, Why Have I Been Excommunicated, I think was the title. <laughs> 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 it was like, okay, like the very title itself is so like vitriolic and like it's just a grenade into a, into a, into a room. You know, it's like you're not even on a, you're not even trying to interact charitably. It's like, Daddy, Why Have I Been Excommunicated? It's like, okay, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I think we're approaching kind of the end and um, had a really great time talking with you guys, getting to hear your answers. Um, I'm glad we can, you know, come into this uh, format, differing views, but also have a civilized conversation. You know, I think that's at least when I'm watching debates, sometimes I'm just it doesn't even matter if I agree with the guy. Like, I'm just like, ah, oh, like please like don't be such a, you know? Uh, and so, and so, uh, yeah, with that, I'd love if, uh, now, now that since Danny went, how about Keith, if it's all right with you, you give the closing statement. Sure. And then, and then Danny, the altar call, give us the altar call, brother. Well, <laughs> well, I, I do. I, I want to, uh, echo something that Danny said at the beginning. He said, the Bible is one story. And the story is the, the that God saves sinners. And he does so through his covenant relationship with them. And the irony of tonight's debate is how much Danny and I have agreed on many things. And we do agree on so much. We agree that there is salvation in no other, for there is only one name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we have a great blessing in sharing that unity in the gospel. So any difference that Danny and I have demonstrated tonight in this debate,
debate should not be construed as being two men who are not brothers, but rather two brothers who have differing opinions on an important subject. So I'm thankful for my brother. I'm thankful for this opportunity. I'm thankful that we have many things in common, and I'm thankful that we can together continue to preach the gospel as, I, as I've as i always been so grateful to see men like John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul, who stood on the same chancel, who preached the gospel together, even though they went back to their churches and had disagreements over these issues, they were able to stand together. And I'm thankful to stand together with Danny and preach the gospel. So I, I say that uh, I'm right. Believe me, trust me, everything I said is correct. And, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I, we all have areas of our theology. Yeah, yeah. We all have areas of theology. We all have areas of our theology in which we're growing. And uh, I just want to say that I hope that tonight I helped you better understand, even if you're on the other side, I hope that I help you better understand why a Baptist would hold to the convictions that we do. And I pray to the Lord that I articulated it well. So thank you for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Thank you. All right. Well, um, you know, I was hoping that Keith, first of all, thanks to Keith. It's been fun to, to, to at least see him, you know, live as opposed to just uh, on Instagram reels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which uh, I just get a kick out of. And uh, my, my, my older kids, uh, I have a 20 year old now, in college, in college, he's away uh, in college playing basketball, and uh, and I have a 17 year old, almost 18 year old here, and so you know those videos, um, you know for for like you know for like I described my story at the beginning of the of, of our interview tonight, our talk tonight, uh, you know, and so my wife and I are very zealous to like teach our kids the reform faith, um, and so our kids, you know, don't really know the kinds of churches that we come out of, and so. Um, those videos are so funny. Because it's like, <laughs> okay, the big Eva. That was that was your dad right there. You know, that was dad right there doing doing big Eva youth pastor. So, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's cool to to, to meet you uh, in person. And uh, Mason, thanks for putting us together. Um, so yeah, you know, unfortunately Keith didn't come in his uh, Methodist garb. You know, or else I would have really really won. But um, yeah, it's it was it was fun. So. Um, yeah, just to kind of reiterate, you know, the the idea again that uh, God is a covenantal God. He works uh, in a covenantal way. Uh, I know it's kind of cliche, but um, you know that's that's the basis of why we baptize our babies. Uh, we think that our children belong to the to the covenant of God's grace, and um, we baptize them uh, in faith and we do so, um, our, our form for baptism, I think is important to, to, re to reiterate, um, the historical reformed, you know, explanation and liturgy for baptism says that uh, the pastor addresses the parents by saying, we don't do this out of custom or superstition. So, um, I think a lot of people view infant baptism as that just mere custom or superstition. Um, you know, and I, and I think, you know, uh, you know, as Keith demonstrated like conscientious, you know, desire to follow scripture, you know, we would want to, you know, we would say the same thing that we, this is, you know, to the best of our lights, uh, us understanding scripture and putting it all together um, and teaching our parents to raise their children well. And so, um, you know, the Heidelberg Catechism, I'll just close by reading question 74. Um, and this, this will cue the come as you are uh, and put the sawdust down in the aisle, brother. Here we go. Here's the mm -hmm. altar call. Uh, should infants also be baptized? Yes. Uh, infants as well as adults are included in God's covenant and people. So that's what we've been saying all night. Uh, and they, no less than adults, are promised deliverance from sin through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit who works faith. So again, it's important for us to reiterate that we don't think baptism, uh, when we, we, we see a line, people saying, you know, quoting that line from the New Testament, baptism saves. Um, yes, but we want to qualify that, right? And you know, Christ saves by the power of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the outward sign of that. So uh, therefore, by baptism, the sign of the covenant, uh, they too should be incorporated into the Christian church and distinguished from the children of unbelievers. Um, and so uh, it, cl it closes by saying this was done in the Old Testament by circumcision, which was replaced in the New Testament by baptism. So pray the Lord blesses all of us and all those who are listening and watching um, to search the scriptures daily to see what is uh, the correct view, uh, which is always going to be, if you're not Dutch, you're not much. Uh. <laughs> Love that it. That is funny. I've heard that actually. Um, 
Yeah, and Keith, I'm still waiting on my shipment of Calvinol. It hasn't shown up yet. It's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, I thank really you. Appreciate it. I pray that you know people are benefit from it, and um, I uh, I hope that you guys have a blessed Sunday this this Sunday. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. And, Preach the word, uh, brother. Yeah. Amen. You as well. God bless.